I have an accent, but you also have an accent from my point of view. So let's try to make this work. I'm going to try to speak about human capital. Human capital, when we think about retirement, we don't consider human capital as an investment part of the portfolio, but it is. So that's where I'm going to go. Let's look. This is United States. You can see that uh, 401ks are more and more important in the retirement arena. Pension DB plans are going down, so more people have the flexibility to decide how to invest their money. Is that good or bad? This is a track record. Having the flexibility to decide how you invest is something good. All of us want to make that decision. Why? Because if that decision is in our hands, we can incorporate other parts of our wealth inside the retirement planning. The problem is, is that we are not able to understand how to invest and how to plan for the future, especially when you are dealing with markets like the one that we have today. The decisions can be catastrophic. The track record is these are estimated numbers. No one knows how IRAs uh, have performed. But IRAs is basically the most flexible way to invest. You have an account, and you decide how to invest it. And you can invest in all the options that you have. So the investor has all the flexibility. The DB plan is the investor has no flexibility. A professional team is investing for them. And then the 401k, in general, the investor have options that are selected by a committee, and so the flexibility is, is medium flexibility. You can see that the flexibility has not helped investors achieve good performance. You can see the difference in performance from 98 to 2003 is 3.8% a year for IRAs where the, the employee has, or the, the retiree that is saving with his own freedom to decide where to put the money, that performance is well below 401ks. And 401ks is even below DB plans. So what's the problem? It's even worse than the numbers that you see there. Because the IRAs have achieved that level of return, taking way more risk. So this is an understatement of the level of, of, of risk and return that they are taking. So how can we help? Well, what's the investor problem? That's the first thing that we have to ask. What's my problem today? I'm making money today. I want to retire someday in the future. So my problem is very simple. I consume today or I consume tomorrow. It's not how much money I will have tomorrow. It's a decision when I will decide to consume. If I buy an expensive car today, I may not have money to live until I'm 100. I will have to survive for my kids. So that's a problem. When we frame the problem in that way, then what we need to worry is try to convey that knowledge to the guy that is out there working and trying to save for retirement. And this is important, and you will see in a minute, that the saving for retirement is not a static problem. It's a dynamic problem. Why is dynamic? because it depends how the markets have performed. How can we help investors understand what is asset allocation and how important is that asset allocation? What is expected returns? What is risk? Probably between us, if we take a survey, we will not define what is the risk and what are the biggest risks that we face if we are saving for retirement. And what's labor income and how will it play a role in uh, retirement? So the industry has tried to help, of course. We try to help because uh, we are a service provider, and so the, be the better services, the more we can sell, but it's the right incentives. So we have tried to help by providing two kind of strategies. One is a, life a lifestyle fund, basically a balance strategy. We target levels of risk, we put more fixed income, less fixed income, more equities. So we try to define a level of risk and deliver a very well diversified strategy with a level of risk. The other ones are life cycle funds, basically a fund that if you are 40 years old, that fund will change allocation, but you buy that fund that is a 2000 
and 22. And so by the time that you retire, that fund will change the location from a high level of equities to a low level of equities and a high level of fixed income. So the location is changed in time according to your age. These are very simple solutions, but they really help. So the question is, are they too simplistic? They are simple. It's a big step forward, but there are things that we have to still teach the investor in order to customize and use these two set of funds together and other funds in order to incorporate different aspects of their life in the retirement planning. For example, the first question that you ask, and, and just go and ask, take a survey out there with your employees or, or, or the people investing in, in your funds, and say, why age is important? Why the time horizon is important? The first thing all of us know or have heard, that we have to have more fixed income as the older we get. Why? Well, if you have studied the problem scientifically, there are two reasons, or let's say three reasons. The first one is the older we get, the more conservative we get with taking risks. So we are changing the risk tolerance with age. Leave that aside, because not all of us change the risk tolerance in time. There are two scientific reasons why to change the asset allocation in time. The first one, if if stocks behave like in a mean reversion model, that means the long-term volatility of stocks is much lower than short-term volatility of stocks. So the longer our time span for investment, the, more, the less equity risk that we take. So that's up for debate. Why is up to debate? Because we have only 100 years of history. And if you try to analyze long periods of time and try to see if it's true that volatility of stocks decay over time, you don't have enough observations. You start getting into overlapping observations and you have basically data on one market for a long period of time. There is other reason why it's clear that you have to change the allocation to fixed income and equities or risky and riskless assets over time. That reason is human capital. And why is that? Let's suppose I'm, I'm just starting to work, and I'm trying to save 40, for 40 years from now. What's my wealth today? I don't have any financial wealth. I don't have any money in my pocket. My wealth is just the discounts of all the cash flows that I'm going to get as labor income. So my total wealth is my human capital plus my financial wealth. So. Given that, if you start thinking that human capital is part of your total wealth, you have to incorporate that human capital in your asset allocation. That's very difficult for the industry. Why? Because all of us are different. Not all of us have the same human capital. For example, if I'm an athlete and I compete in the Olympics, and that's the only thing that I do, I cannot work past 40 or put, a, put an age. My life is, my labor income at that, in that profession at least is cut at that age. We did work for an industry, pilots, plane pilots. They have to retire at 60. So they have a fixed day. After that, they cannot work. On the other side, you can have a very flexible work, for example, a physician, where you can work until you want. You can have a very risky profession, like stockbroker, or you can have a very safe profession as a tenured professor. So all those differences have to be taken into account whenever you do your asset allocation if you are considering human capital. So how can we incorporate that into retirement planning? Well, let's try to start designing a retirement plan, taking into account and trying to teach the investor how to save for retirement. Let's try to help that investor measure how risky or how riskless is his labor income. 
So if we have investors, and, and this will have to be done through education, through platform that can, people can access and decide how that labor income is. So if I have a highly flexible and resilient labor income, I can consider that that labor income is just a fixed income portfolio. It's a bond. Let's suppose that I'm a tenure professor. If I'm a tenure professor, basically I cannot get fired. If I cannot get fired, that means that I will get that income every year until I decide to retire. That's a fixed income portfolio to me. There is not much of a difference. Let's suppose that I work as a stockbroker, and when the markets do very well, I make a lot of money, and when the markets go down, I just don't make any money. Well, my, my labor income is basically a stock portfolio. So once I take that into account, I can move on and decide how to incorporate the human capital into a, my portfolio. So by the industry has to find a way to incorporate these pieces of information, this iterationity, into the portfolio construction. So what I want to do now is to start building a portfolio, an asset allocation, for someone saving for retirement. It's going to be a very simple model, but let's go through and let's see how can we improve the current uh, solutions. So let's forget about the idea of mean reversion. That can be incorporated and complicate things, but let's suppose that there is no mean reversion. So what's the theoretical allocation that someone should have to risky assets? The theoretical allocation to risky assets is proportional to the premium on those risky assets divided by the risk and the risk adversion coefficient. So if the premium is very large, I will put more money in risky assets. If I'm completely insensitive to risk and I don't care about taking a lot of risk, I will put a lot of money in risky assets. So there is a little formula there that says the allocation to risky assets goes like the premium of the risky asset divided by the risk of those risky assets. Yeah? So what's risk and what's riskless? What is a riskless asset? That's the first question. We have to agree on what is riskless. So to define what's riskless, we have to say, how can I run out of money? A very simple way is inflation. If I have a bunch of Australian, a bunch of here, big of pile of Australian dollars, and it happened that I have a lot of inflation, the, the amount of bread that I can buy with those Australian dollars will be well less in the future than now. So risk, inflation is part of risk. So how can I hedge inflation? Well, one simple way is inflation-protected bonds. From what I know, they are not highly available in Australia. Uh, they are more available in the U.S. thanks to our deficit. But, uh, <laughs> but one of the typical errors is saying equities are a good hedge against inflation. And that's certainly not the case. I'm putting there some correlations between inflation in the U.S. and different asset classes. You can see that equities have extremely low or even negative correlation with inflation. So if I'm trying to hedge inflation, equities is certainly not an option. Long-term bonds, obviously, is not an option. Short-term bonds is the best hedge if you don't have tips on inflation-protected securities against inflation. Why? Because the interest rate is reset on short periods of time in order to cover what is expected to be inflation. So once we decide that a good hedge for inflation is short-term bonds, then we, start, we can start worrying about the other part of the portfolio, the risky part of the portfolio. So let's suppose that I'm extremely young. My total wealth is my human capital, my future savings, plus my financial wealth. 
So the ratio that I have, and I work in a profession that is not sensitive to the stock market. Yeah? So basically, my human capital is basically bonds. So my ratio of my human capital over my financial wealth is extremely large because I don't have financial wealth. It's all human capital. I already say that my human capital is bonds. So if I want to, my risk profile tells me that I want to have a 70-30 portfolio, 70% 70 equities, 30% fixed income portfolio, I'm already having too much in fixed income. I need more risky assets, equities or whatever. How can I do that? Two ways. One is I borrow money. Go to someone, go to the bank, I say, look, I will make a lot of money in the future, believe me. Give me money. Uh, I don't think that that will happen. So what's the other option? That's a, that's a, that's the theoretical option, because if you start thinking that you, you believe in the mean variance optimization, what you are doing by borrowing money, you are moving along the tangent to the fishing frontier. So that's optimal. The problem is that no one will give you money if you're young and promise that you're going to pay back in the future. So the other solution is to start moving along the curve of the friction frontier, not the tangent. And what you do is you take more risk by investing in risky assets. When you are very young, you invest a lot in very risky assets that promise a lot of payoff. When you start getting older, you move your portfolio, your risky portfolio, to a more conservative portfolio, and then you start adding fixed income. So here I'm going to plot, and I'm going to describe the plots because I'm sorry I cannot see from the back, the risk profile and the return profile, the specter return profile, for an asset allocation. When I'm very young, I'm going to invest 100% of my money in stocks. Anyone that you ask, is that a very risky portfolio? They will answer yes, it's risky. Now, when I'm young, let's suppose two years after work, I will have in my savings, let's put a number, $30,000. That money is nothing if you compare with the amount of savings that I will have in the future. So. The total risk profile of my portfolio, once I incorporate the human capital, is extremely low, even below the optimal that I need to get. So having very risky portfolios, fully, per, fully exposed to equities or risky assets, is not a bad idea when you are extremely young. If you look at the risk profile of the portfolio, you will see when you get the plot, that the portfolio, once you incorporate human capital, have, with 100% in equities, have basically no volatility. And why is that? Again, because we have considered that our human capital is bond-like, ret produce bond-like returns. Now, we say that we cannot leverage. No bank will give us money to leverage the portfolio. So the only way to deal with this is to take risky assets. Different people will have different ways to get more risky assets. We at Dimension believe that the way to produce more higher returns, taking more risky assets, is to invest in a value stocks and a small cap stocks, emerging markets. Other people will have different views. But we in our case, what we produce is our portfolios. And when you are extremely young, not only have 100% in equities, they extremely tilt to value stocks, small stocks, and emerging market stocks. Yeah? With that, we increase the level of risk of the portfolio. And with that, we increase the specter return of the portfolios. The older you get, the more market-like the portfolio gets. And then we start increasing the fixed income allocation. So let's run some analysis, some Monte Carlo analysis, on the following the strategy that I just described, on trying to see 
what's the probability of running out of money? So I've been saving, and this is a study that we did for a given into the pilots. Uh, they have to retire at 60 years old by regulation. And so, and they make a salary that is basically a table. You know how much money they will make depending on their age. So it's, it's, it's very simple to do, at least for this company that we were working with. And so these guys wanted to take out home after retirement $100,000 a year. So we ran the analysis of what's the probability of running out of money. And you can see that the probability of running out of money is high. And why is high? Because the market is not predictable. We cannot say this year, three years ago, we didn't know that there was going to be this kind of crisis that we have today. So all the outcomes depends on what the performance that you have in your risky assets. But if you have labor and you recognize that it's a matter of consuming today or consuming tomorrow, the investor can go and put more money in order to have more consumption tomorrow. So again, the education and the interaction with the investor starts playing a very, very important role. So what other things really matter? Another thing that really matters is diversification. Why it matters? Because we care about compounded returns. And the lack of diversification produces an increase in variance, and that increase in variance affects the final outcomes. And the way it affects the final outcomes is reduce the mean at the expense of having long tails. So basically, I care more about the mean, that is what gives me food at the table, than the big tail of buying a Ferrari because everything went extremely well. So, very well diversified portfolios are extremely important for people saving for retirement. And this is what we saw at the very beginning, that the IRAs are lacking. They're making big bets on sectors or big bets on stocks, and that's they are underperforming pension, pension plan DBs or, D, or DC, 401ks. So given this, how can we help the investor. We just assign a life retirement path. How to allocate money over time. So a way to help investor is explain all the details, all the different assumptions that we make in order to define that life savings, life savings strategy. If I'm telling you that my life, life savings strategy was designed assuming that your labor was riskless, you will know whenever you go and decide how to use that specific product, that that product may not be for you or that you may need to customize that product with an overlay of a, life cycle, a lifestyle fund. If you have a DB plan, that is give you, giving you a certain amount of money per, per year, that has to be taken into account. And the only one that will know that is the end investor saving for retirement. So this is not all. Let's suppose that we are in, in, in the tech boom and I have a bunch of stock in Cisco. Stocks goes up, goes up, goes up, at a certain point, I have enough money in that stock, and I'm using that stock on purpose. You have enough money in that stock so that you can sell that position, buy inflation-protected securities, and completely lock your earnings for the rest of your life. That's an exit strategy from investing. If you have a lifestyle fund or a, a life cycle fund, that's not taken into account anywhere. So an exit strategy from any kind of investment has to be prescribed and analyzed at the investor level. 
We, the industry, cannot provide that solution, but we have to provide tools so that the person saving for retirement can get an analysis like that and tell us, I have to, can reduce my risk today because I already got enough in savings and I can lock my earnings without taking any more risk. So what's the next generation of retirement solutions? What we are working on is a way to have a narrow band of outcomes at the time of retirement. What does it mean? You know that the outcomes are going to be a probability distribution with two tails. The tail where you make a lot, a lot of money will be there. The truth is that if you sign off for having $100,000 a year of retirement, and you can live with the band between 75 and 150, you really don't care about making 250 with a probability of 1%. That's really an outcome that you didn't sign off. And the worst case is that that outcome is not free, because that's the outcome that you face when I was describing Cisco. So if things go extremely well for you during certain years of your retirement plan, what you should do is take into account that you have done extremely, extremely well and reduce your level of risk to the point that if you get to the possibility of locking in your gains and guarantee earnings for all your lifespan, for example, buying an annuity, you just get out of risky assets and completely lock it in. So if you find a solution where there is an interaction between the investor and the fund manager, and in that interaction the investor can define what's the ban of outcomes that he's looking for, we can truncate the upper tail of the distribution of outcomes and use that excess probability that we are getting there to increase the probability of getting the, the outcomes in the band where we are looking for. And that's managing the risk profile of the portfolio depending on the outcomes of the portfolio, depending on the past performance of the portfolio. The only way to do that is interacting with the client. That means that there are a lot of operational issues. I cannot put a fund that does that. Because if both of us retire in 10 years, you may have been in that fund 10 years before me and have a completely different outcome than the one that I'm having. But this is the next solution, and this is the way that investors will be able to have a more certain outcome by getting rid of upper tails. So to conclude, all the, the industry has provided are good tools to get, help people get to retirement. Target maturity funds, life cycle funds, have been a huge improvement relative to the complete wild west of go and pick whatever you want in the IRAs. Lifestyle funds, risk-based balance strategies, have provided great tools to have diversified portfolios that can be overlaid on life cycle funds in order to customize your risk profile. What is needed is the next step. How can we interact with the end investor, teach them how to change the risk profile in order to maximize the probability of getting to the desired outcome at the time of retirement? That will have imply very sophisticated tool to know where the investor wealth is today and models that are going to describe the different premiums in the different asset classes going forward in order to maximize the minimum level of income and the range that you want to get. And all these comes with one more degree of flexibility. The moment that the end investor understands that human capital is an asset, 
he can deploy that in a better way. He will use that asset to consume more today or to save more today. And that will depend on how his financial savings have done relative to where he wants them to be at the time of retirement. 